it's all up here. Anyway, I've, uh, I've made a few notes. Oh, David, look at your tongue. Don't worry. I've got it all sorted out. Appointment to see Mr. Henderson. I'll let him know you're here. Um, come this way, please. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Morning. 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 Please come in and sit down. Thank you. Now. Oh. How can I help you? We've come about getting some building money. A home improvement loan, yes? That's right, yeah. We want a bit of building work done and some new radiators and the, uh, the bathroom needs proper fixing up and uh, we want to do some general decorating round the house. Oh, yeah, and we need a new main ring. <laughs> Sorry, a new ring main. <laughs> uh, have you got any plans or, or estimates for the work? I, I, I did manage to jot down this sketch on the uh, on the bus coming here. It uh, it shows where we'll probably want the new radiators and, and what colour we want the new lampshades to be. <laughs> and uh, how many radiators will you need? Well, we thought about two or, or five. My brother reckons it'll cost between one and four thousand pounds to do the work. Ah, your brother's a chartered surveyor. Uh, not really, more of a driving instructor. But we do feel that the improvements will increase the market value of the property. Look, before we go any further, I think you'd better have a look at this video. Now, the Halifax have had it made to help people sort out their home improvement ideas. Now, why don't you have a look at the chapters that you're concerned with, come back and see me in a week's time, and then I'm sure that we can organise something for you quite quickly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Billy Kin. You've just put into your video recorder the very first in a series of videotapes from the Halifax Home Improvement Video Library. The videos are designed to help you get to grips with home improvements in your house or flat. This particular video is divided into 20 six-minute chapters. Each one covers an important area of home improvement, from putting on a new roof to putting up new curtains. When the Halifax Building Society asked me to make this film, to demonstrate how easy improving your home can be, the very first thing I did was to go to a number of leading manufacturers to ask them to help me show you exactly what we can achieve by home improvement. We looked for a fairly average property which was in need of renovation to demonstrate all the improvements. And I engaged Ian Howard, a chartered building surveyor, who in turn recommended the builder, Barrieris, to carry out all the work. With all the finishing detail and accessorising done by interior designer Linda Lowe, in conjunction with the manufacturers and British home stores. The video is designed so that you can easily pick out the exact chapter or group of chapters that you're interested in. By using the fast forward and rewind buttons, you can locate exactly what you want to see. The first 20 seconds of each chapter has a chapter number and a symbol displayed in the bottom right hand corner of the picture, so you can find exactly where you are when you're using the visual search. Each chapter is summarized in this 48 page color booklet, which comes with the video and is for you to keep as a permanent reference source and starting point for further information. So let's begin where all home improvements usually start, with raising the money. The simplest and quickest way of raising the money for home improvements is to approach your building society, though not the way our couple did. I, I did manage to chop down this sketch on the, on the bus coming here. But they've now taken the Halifax branch manager's advice and have sat down and done their homework. So let's see how they make out this time. Ah, oh, Mrs. Wendover. Mr. Wendover. Morning. Please sit down. Thank you. 
Well, how have things been going? Well, Mr. Henderson, we, we bought our house with a Halifax mortgage three years ago. And now we'd like to have, uh, I think you call it a home improvement loan for some work which we want to do to the property. We thought about it very carefully and we're sure that the work will increase the value of the house. We've, uh, we've had estimates for the building work, uh, one for £2,500, the other for just over £3,000. That's just for the basic work, uh, but that does include wiring, plumbing, extra central heating. We estimate the fittings will come to just over £1,500, um, but we plan to do all the decoration ourselves. Allowing for the extra bits and pieces, we thought we ought to have a contingency amount on top of about £1,000. That makes £5,500. Are you having the work supervised by uh, an architect or a surveyor? Yes, we've had a building surveyor drop the plans and he put us in touch with one of the builders. The other builder belongs to the Building Employers Confederation. And we found out that they run a guarantee scheme, which means you don't have to have a professional person to supervise the work. And they just charge 1% of the contract price for the insurance cover. And have you got building regulations approval for the structural work? Yes. And we've also found out that we don't need any planning permission. Uh, have you checked whether there's any chance of you getting a local council improvement grant? Uh, yes. I picked up a leaflet from the local town hall, but I'm afraid there's not much chance in our case. And by how much do you estimate your house value increasing? Well, we, we bought our house for £31,000, and uh, a house very like ours, but with full central heating, uh, just down the road, went for £39,000 only last month. And how much of your total cost would you like to borrow? All of it, if possible, please. Oh, fine. Yes, I think that we can arrange the lot. But I will have to get our valuer to give me an up-to-date valuation of the property, uh, taking your improvements into account. Um, he will charge a fee of about, uh, let me see, uh, yes, about £30. OK, if you need that to tell us how much we can borrow. Well, yes, we do, because the total new loan will come to more than the original valuation. Right. What about monthly payments? Well, a line for tax relief on interest on the first uh, £30,000, your monthly interest payments to the Halifax will go up by... Uh, it's by £54.12. pence. Now, the premium on additional life assurance would be... Nine pounds sixty nine pence. So that would make your total new payment come to three hundred and five pounds ninety pence. Hmm. Well, I think we can manage that. David was promoted to area manager last year, and I've now gone back to work as a secretary with the children at school. We've worked out our monthly income and outgoings. Uh, here's my last pay slip, as well as Sue's. As you can see, together we're bringing in just over £1,400 before tax. Yes, well, that's good enough for our purposes. But there are a couple of other points. Now, your builder may want stage payments, and with larger loans like yours, we're happy to arrange this. But it does mean that our valuer will have to reinspect before each payment is released, and a small fee will have to be charged for his visits. And finally, he will reassess the replacement value of the property for insurance purposes. We will instruct Sun Alliance to increase your house insurance to the new figure when the improvements are complete. So, do you think we'll be able to have our home improvement loan, Mr Henderson? Oh, I'm sure we'll be able to help you. We're only too delighted to help our members. Well, we've been through the details. Why don't you make out an application form while you're in the office? When did you last take a look at the roof over your head? From down here, there doesn't appear to be anything much wrong up there. But when you look at this drawing, prepared by our chartered building surveyor, you can see that the roof is in fact trying to do the split. The moral of this story is to make sure that you have a full structural survey before you buy a property, because all that looks well often isn't on close inspection. If you're unlucky enough to find a major structural fault, you must negotiate a new price based on the likely repair cost, and this is exactly what we did. Many roofs built between the walls are coming to the end of their useful life, not because they're structurally unsound, but because the coverings are starting to cause problems. Tiles start spalling, that is flaking, through frost action and weather, while slates start sliding 
because the fixing holes are wearing through. All these are telltale signs that trouble's on its way. Now let me warn you against two common alternatives to re-roofing. Patching it yourself is perhaps the most tempting way of fixing a leaky roof. It's cheap and any reasonably intelligent person can have a go at it. Apart from making your house look a mess, the chances are you'll have to repair it again and again. And you'll end up spending a lot of time and money in the long run. Another short-term option is to slop a protective coating over the tiles to seal up any gaps and leaks. But it can ruin your entire roof by cutting off the air circulation in the roof space and aggravate timber decay. You can, however, re-roof a period house with second-hand or traditional clay tiles. But there's no guarantee on how long they will last, and they can also make your bank account cave in. All an ordinary house needs is a sound, good-looking, maintenance-free roof. So we asked Marley, the leaders in the field, to show us their comprehensive range, from which we chose Mendip Old English Red for our roof and new porch. The first thing they did was to strip the old roof. They then fitted reinforced bitumen felt underlay. This will help keep the dust and fine powdered snow out of the roof space. New battens are nailed to the rafters. They form the base on which the tiles are securely fixed. Finally, they put on the ridge and verge tiles bedded in mortar. Ever tried mixing mortar in the rain? It's impossible. But Marley also make a complete dry fix system, which allows work on your roof to continue despite the weather. The great thing about this system is that it mechanically fixes the tiles without the need for mortar. Most houses nowadays have gable roofs, for which the system was designed, and this new technology allows the ridge and eaves to be properly ventilated. Now, if your new tiles are going to last for a lifetime of your home, which indeed they will, it's important that the flashings, like those around this chimney, are made of a similar long-lasting material and lead is the only answer. It's extremely malleable and can be easily dressed to fit multi-curve contours of concrete roof tiles. While you've got your scaffolding up, you should take the opportunity to check on the other higher up parts of your house. For example, the fascia and soffit board can often need replacing if it's sagging and pulling the guttering out of alignment because the timber's rotten. Now, Marley make a very good low-cost fascia soffit system, which does not need painting and requires little maintenance. You should also check on your chimney pointing and have any chimney pots cap that you're not using to cut off heat loss. If you've engaged a chartered building surveyor, he would normally recommend a reliable contractor. But otherwise, you can go to the National Federation of Roofing Contractors, who can advise on roofing problems and put you in touch with the right companies. As with all major works, get at least two quotes. Check the estimates carefully to see who's looking after what. And if you're using more than one company on the job, make sure you know who is liable if there are any disasters. Roofing is one area where you might well need a Halifax Home Improvement Loan to do the job, using top quality products from a manufacturer like Marley. Your new roof will help maintain the value of your property for many years to come.
Have you ever wondered where all the water goes? When you turn on the tap, you flush a lavatory. Or hose down the car. Well, the answer lies in the soil. The thousands of gallons of rainwater that fall each year on your property and the thousand gallons of wastewater and sewerage an average household produces per day is disposed of in two ways. All the foul water, that is sewerage, bath water, washing up water, flows into the main drainage system which runs outside your house. And all the surface water splashing down on your lawn and drive and gushing down from the guttering is normally piped separately to a convenient discharge point, perhaps a natural stream, or allowed to disperse into the subsoil through a constructed soakaway. This is all straightforward enough, but what happens if your drainage system becomes inadequate, say, when you come to extend your house? That's exactly what has happened with this house. The problem was that the original drains were laid without a proper fall. And with all the increase in use from such modern appliances as washing machines and dishwashers, there were occasions when the water would back up and cause a smelly blockage. When you unearth your drains, this is probably what you'll find. Good old-fashioned clay pipe, been around for decades. And in its modern form, still the very best for the job. With luck, you'll never have to relay or reconnect the entire drainage system. But you should always have the drains checked out by a surveyor before you buy a house. We've planned a second lavatory here, but the problem is that the original drain is on the other side of the house, so we're installing a new one here to cope with it. Provided that you obtain local authority approval of your plans in advance, this is a job well within the grasp of a competent do-it-yourselfer. We hired an excavator to dig the new trench, taking care not to interfere with any other pipe or cable connections running to our house. But generally, you'd expect to do the job by hand. Having prepared the trenches, you can then lay the pipes. These are vitrified clay again. The Hepworth Super Sleeve System. Plain end pipes and fittings, which are easy to assemble. Like this. The pipeline must be laid with an even fall so that it'll flow smoothly. You will need to provide access at the head of each drain run, at a change of direction, and at or near pipe junctions. And one of the simplest ways of providing access to a drain for rodding purposes is to install a rodding point like this. Here we can introduce a piece of new technology from the super sleeve range, a ready-made polypropylene inspection chamber. This saves all the bother of building a traditional type of chamber and ensures that there will be no deterioration with age. Obviously, other plumbing discharges have to be accommodated in the system connected to the main drain. If you need help with the installation, you'll find that a firm like Hepworth will provide illustrated advice or, if necessary, more technical guidance. The whole system has to be watertight and the local authority will have to supervise a mandatory test before the trench is filled and the ground reinstated. The local authority will not normally allow rainwater to be discharged into a foul drain. If there is no surface water drainage and providing the ground is permeable, you may be able to connect your rainwater drains to a soakaway. This is a chamber built in the ground to which the pipes from your roof gutters are connected. We've installed new plastic guttering from Bartol, another Hepworth company. 
and in this case, we've used an angular profile instead of the more conventional half round. To guard against the flooding of the drive, we put in a surface water drain here and connected it to the soakaway. If you're the practical type, you might even want to add to your tools a set of rodding equipment so that in the event of a blockage, a fairly unlikely event with a modern drainage system, you can do the job for yourself. With the drainage work complete, you can then put the garden back to rights, knowing that all's well below. Now look at this for a problem. A garden that's gone to seed, a grotty drive that drains all the water straight into the foundations of the house. Where do we start? Well, that's as good a place as any, and while we're at it, we might as well get rid of the garage. Well, that only took a day. Let's put down a new surface. It's called Europa Block Paving, and it's manufactured by Countryside Masonry. It's very straightforward to lay, but it does require careful planning. Your foundation should be a firm, hardcore base with two inches of sharp sand, and it should slope away from the house. You'll also need to build a storm drain to cope with excess surface water. The block should be laid into locking for the extra strength needed for a driveway. Make the width of your drive an exact number of blocks. The edge will be firmer and you will need fewer cut blocks. And for those you do have to cut, use a bolster and hammer. Or hire a block splitter. Always work off planks to avoid tilting or shifting the blocks which have been laid. Settle the blocks into place with a hard mechanical vibrator. The blocks will automatically be spaced correctly because of the built-in spacer. So it's all practical, it's a very rewarding job. But of course you can always get a contractor to do it. The main thing is that you will add real and lasting value to the property and it's the sort of project that can be financed by a Halifax Home Improvement Loan. The result, with the garden landscaped and looking trim and neat, is quite stunning. We could have rebuilt the garage, but a carport allows for unrestricted access and also costs a lot less to construct. The back garden, as you can see, has been let go completely. It has tremendous potential. But from here, I would definitely say that we needed a large patio door and a terrace for summer. And I've chosen this Derbyshire textured paving for the patio because it's especially light and easy to handle. If possible, it's best to start in a corner, laying the slabs on a firm mix of sand and cement. You should level the ground, making a slight fall away from the house, and ensure that the finish is six inches below the damp-proof course. I've also marked out the area with pegs and string. Put a good trowel full of cement mix at each corner and one in the middle. Then gently lay the slab in position
and tap it down with the wooden handle of a hammer or mallet and check for accuracy with a spirit level. For our complicated corner piece, it's easier to cut the slab with a grinder. For the more straightforward cuts, you'll only need a bolster. Now, doesn't that make all the difference? Just look at the garden, a real transformation. The ornamental fish pond. The clever use of paving in different styles, combined with cobblestones. And garden wall with screen blocks. A super barbecue which is fun to use and build. In fact, there is no end to the number of possibilities and permutations with this reconstituted stone from countryside masonry. But don't just stop with your garden. Come in and look at this. It's a marvellous way of making a modern fireplace, and it's certainly one way of coordinating the house with the garden. And all these ideas and many more are contained in these two great little booklets published by Countryside Masonry. In them, you'll find all the information you need to tackle any of these and any more projects with confidence. When you come to sell your house, you'll find that prospective purchasers will take into account the added value of what you've done when assessing the worth of the property. There you go. You mean you don't recognize him? You should. He could quite easily have been a non-paying resident in your house for years. He's a nobium punctatum, the common furniture beetle. It's virtually impossible to barricade your house against this little devil. While you will rarely see the beetle itself, you will certainly come across the telltale holes in wood made by its offspring. The only way to deal with them is to call in the experts. Floorboards are lifted. Water tanks are covered twice with polythene and a dust sheet. Loft insulation is rolled up and removed. Joists and rafters are vacuumed. The materials used are highly inflammable. The electrics are switched off. Junction boxes are covered. We're then ready for spraying. Where they find totally infested timber, they cut it out and replace it with treated new wood. Another threat to the house is rising damp. Probably the first thing you'll notice is a damp patch on the wall where perhaps all crystals may form on the brickwork or wallpaper, like this. It's important to discover the cause. The first step is to get Renticule in and have a free survey carried out. Their specialist equipment helps correctly identify the exact cause and appropriate treatment. If they find that you haven't got a damp cause, which is possible in an older house, or that the existing one is ineffective, their surveyor will give you a full report and a quotation for the work. If it's only a leaking downpipe, or an overflowing gutter, or even a flower bed bridging an existing dam course, your house will probably need no treatment. Just remove the source of the suspected dam, and your problems may be solved. But if remedial work is necessary, the dam plaster on the inside has to be taken off to a minimum of three feet above the line of the proposed new dam course. The majority of properties requiring treatment are of a solid wall construction and are usually treated from the outside. 
There are, however, occasions when properties with cavity walls require treatment. In these instances, it can be undertaken from either one or both sides of the wall. The holes are drilled and the wall is injected under pressure with Rentacle Special Silicon Fluid. This will cure and form a protective barrier to prevent moisture being drawn up into the wall. A special plaster, particularly resistant to damp, is applied. New treated skirtings are put on, followed by a second layer of plaster suitable for redecoration. Dry rot, however, is a very different story and is probably the worst thing that can happen to your house. A fungus which can spread anywhere, from room to room, from floor to floor, through plaster, brickwork and wood, it especially loves warmth and damp and can totally wreck your house and frighteningly quickly once it gets a hold. There is only one cure and that is to cut out and destroy all the infected timber up to one metre beyond the infected area and as you could imagine it's a very expensive job. And the work has to be done thoroughly, not least because when you want to sell the house the buyer should demand a cast iron guarantee. Now another form of rot, wet rot. This is not normally as serious as dry rot, as it hardly ever infects the surrounding walls. But it cannot be left unchecked. Like dry rot, it is caused by the wood getting and staying wet enough for the fungus to germinate. In this case, the timbers have rotted, probably because of a broken downpipe beneath the ground, and it'll be necessary to replace the timbers and deal with the cause of dampness. Whilst wet rot is most serious if present in the structural timbers of your house, it is most commonly seen at windows which have not been maintained properly, allowing the bottom of the frame to be constantly soaked by water. If it has not gone too far, a special rentacle preparation can be injected into the woodwork and which, combined with a special filler, can give a new lease of life, guaranteed for ten years. A periodic look at your floorboards, furniture and rafters could help you discover any problems early on. There are plenty of DIY kits available, especially for treating furniture. But these can only be effective if used properly. A simple chair, maybe, but with the main structure of the house, ask yourself the question, could you guarantee your work for 30 years? And if you could, what do you think a prospective purchaser would think? By the same token, if you're thinking of using some small firm or one-man band to do the work for you, just ask yourself this. In an industry where some 600 new companies start up each year and about the same number go out of business, what are the chances that your little firm's 30-year guarantee will be worth the paper it's printed on? With Rentacle, who have been around for more than 50 years, you have a company which has already seen some of its 30-year guarantees through. They will give you a guarantee for the work done. You can also take out their special insurance against future woodworm or wood rot attack in other parts of the house which are vulnerable. And that is quite a point, because there's actually no way you could stop our friend Anobium punctatum from flying around and trying to visit you again. Half of all the houses in this country were built before the last war, and at least a third were built before even the First World War, when conditions were very different to the way in which we live now. For instance, this 1930s house would benefit from internal alterations, and it's easy to do with modern building materials. This means we can think in terms of restructuring some of the rooms to achieve the lifestyle we want. For example, if we take a bite out of this room in order to create an all-suite bathroom with a master bedroom next door. And the loo against the outside wall, like that, creates, say, a sanitary unit here, like that, and build a decent shower just here.
All we need now is to create an opening. Perhaps in the shape of an arch. Do check first whether your wall is load-bearing or not. Of course, you will need professional advice before you try anything like that. All that remains now is to build the wall. Bricks and mortar are too expensive and unsuitable for this task. The answer is to construct a timber stud wall. A very simple operation, well within the capacity of most handymen, and not a hugely expensive task for a builder. You run a piece of timber on the floor, with a corresponding piece plumb above it into the ceiling joist, or into noggins fixed between them. Fix vertical timbers, or studs, at both ends of the partition, and in between. Then we need to brace the studs with horizontal noggins, put in extra noggins to support surface fixings, such as the basin and mirror here, With the framing complete, we now put up the gyprock plasterboard. In fact, British gypsum make a tapered edge plasterboard, which means that you can simply fill the joints for a complete finish, not requiring the skills of a plasterer, nor a lengthy drying out period. The boards are then cut 12 millimeters shorter than the floor to ceiling height, and as you can see, it cuts very easily. They are then positioned and pressed tight against the ceiling with a foot lifter. The boards are fixed with suitable galvanized nails. For sound insulation, the cavity is filled with glass fiber. And when the last board is in position, you're ready to fill the joints with a special filler. Fill the tapered joints with a band of Jiprock Jointex. Into this, bed their joint tape. Apply another broader band of Jointex over the first filling and feather the edges with a sponge. A final thin layer completes the process. As an additional touch, Jiprock Cove, which is a preformed plasterboard cornice, can be used. Then with the skirting board added at the base, you have a complete wall. It's best to use the Jiprock drywall top coat to seal the ivory surface of the plasterboard, and a second coat will provide a vapor check treatment as well. Sealing it in this way enables the subsequent wet stripping of wallpaper for redecoration. British Gypsum make all sorts of other plasterboards for different applications, and this one in particular is extremely good for beefing up the insulation on cold outside walls. Called thermal board, it has a backing of expanded polystyrene. To put this up, apply a special adhesive. And marking the wall with broad widths, comb off the excess, press the board into position, and tamp it back firmly with a heavy straight edge. The board is then secured with Jiprock nailable plugs, thus ensuring that in the event of fire, the board stays in place, and it is finished in the same way as for the stud partition. Meanwhile, with our stud wall, we have a super children's bedroom on one side, 
and this beautiful bathroom on the other. The whole internal planning of a property is now a very flexible proposition. It can keep up with the changing trends in the way we choose to live. Electricity is something we all take for granted. I bet you couldn't keep count of the number of times you switch on and off electrical appliances in the course of an ordinary day. The only times you're really aware of electricity is when something goes wrong with it. but you might find out too late. Every year, 50 people are killed in electrical accidents in the home, and over 3,000 fires are started through faulty electrics. Many of these domestic tragedies could have been avoided through a bit of caution and foresight. Now, if you have a house like this, which hasn't been rewired for ages, you are especially at risk. You might very well still have old cable, like this, which deteriorates with age and can leave live wires exposed behind switches and sockets. Certain types of older cable didn't have an earth wire, so, for example, if you have metal light fittings, they may well not be earth, which is potentially very dangerous. So do what we did with our typical 1930s property and take up the offer by MK Electric to have a free electrical survey carried out by a qualified electrician. Let us start with the place where the electricity comes into your house from the street the distribution board. What an ugly mess that is. Apart from having a confusing collection of fuse boxes, the maze of wiring is a potential hazard. Now yours may not look as bad as our example, but even if you have a fuse board such as this, you're not giving yourself the best possible protection. Old style fuses are perfectly safe in themselves, but when one blows, one never seems to be able to find the right gauge fuse wire. So often people resort to homemade fuses like these, which can allow a serious fault in the ring main to go undetected until it bursts into flames. Much safer and less fiddly to install a modern consumer unit like this. No fuse wire, only a row of miniature circuit breakers which turn themselves off automatically when they're overloaded. All you have to do to restore power is to throw back the switch. The unit can also have built in what's called an earth leakage circuit breaker, an ELCB. This device constantly monitors the flow of electricity around your house. Whenever it detects a current leaking to earth, it immediately cuts off the power, turning what could have been a fatal shock into a small jolt. It could come in handy in all sorts of unexpected ways. For example, at the instant the mower cut the cable, this happened. The ELCB inside detected a leak and immediately cut off the electricity supply. Without the circuit breaker, you might well have been dead. A power drill cutting through a cable, the same thing happens. an exposed flex rubbing against the ironing board. Power cut off, and you live to iron again. In situations such as these and countless others, an ELCB cuts off the power instantly to prevent the user getting a fatal electric shock. There are even individual ELCBs for localised protection in garages and workshops. If you haven't got one, it's very easy to have one connected to an existing installation. And here we come to another problem, and unfortunately, an all too familiar one. This mess, apart from being a threatening assault course to walk around, is creating what's called the Christmas tree effect. Too much power demand on one socket, tripping the fuse switch, or even starting a fire. Our report emphasizes the need to have sufficient 13 amp sockets 
strategically placed in each room to avoid such a dangerous mess. While you're updating the electrical safety of your home, you can choose from a wide variety of accessories with different finishes to fit in with the rest of your room. Furthermore, with the use of a dimmer switch, you can vary the lighting to suit your mood. Now let me give a plug for the humble plug. It's best to use an MK safety plug, which gives you a thoroughly reliable performance and something more. A guide to wiring properly, which is as far as anyone unqualified should go when it comes to electrics in the home. If you're ever in doubt, why not take advantage of MK's offer of a free survey? It's better to repair things the day before they go wrong rather than the day after. Of course you need light to read, but it's just as important to have good lighting to make each room in the house feel warm and lived in. But unless your scheme is restricted to some dimmer switches and the purchase of a few table lamps and standard lamps, your floorboards will have to come up and your walls will have to have new wiring set in them. But if your house needs rewiring, like this one did, then that is the ideal time to really plan the lighting you want. Let's start with first principles and see how lighting can subtly alter appearances. Natural light coming through a window gives this effect. But with artificial light from an ordinary bulb overhead, the room becomes generally much brighter. If we change that for two spotlights, we create a directional light which can focus attention on particular areas of the room. And if we want to create silhouettes, we put a light such as this standard lamp behind the armchair. The effect of an uplight from the front throws dramatic shadows on the wall. So you should consider both the type of light and its position. Now, bearing all this in mind, and with the help of the lighting department of British Home Stores, let's see what we can achieve. You may think it's strange to start at the back patio, but outside lighting can create wonderful effects. Certain aspects and silhouettes of trees and plants are highlighted in ways never normally seen by day. Now here under the carport you certainly need lights and these low energy fittings are a very good idea. At the front these porch lanterns flood the area with light and present a welcoming sight each evening. Step into the porch, and this is where low-energy fluorescent lights won't cost a fortune if left on late into the night. Some designs claim up to 80% energy saving, with a life up to five times longer than an ordinary general service bulb. Fluorescent tubes come in a wide range of lengths. The light given out is cooler than standard incandescent bulbs. And it's shadowless which is excellent for working areas, such as in this kitchen. These down lights have been dimmed to create a subdued setting for meal times. But they can equally well illuminate the whole room. For directional light, you can use either a cluster of spotlights or else a track with spots to highlight the various areas and features of the room. But for general areas in the house, such as the hall or landings, you need a good light in an attractive fitting. With clear bulbs, these glass fittings sparkle, rather like a chandelier. But see how different they look with pearl or frosted bulbs. Now for bedrooms, you need a much more subdued kind of lighting altogether. These mini downlighters give a starlit effect over the bed. This very delicate and feminine light, combined with the decorative alcove, and soft down lights over the window seat create a most romantic setting. Look at the mood we've created here with these pretty Colette table lamps, and we've inset down lighters within the drapes around the bedhead. And what a contrast next door with a rainbow sphere and fun pencils table lamp for children who, when they grow up, will want something a little more high-tech. 
Even where you need the lights to be bright and business-like, you still want the fittings to be in keeping with the design of the room. When you plan your lighting, try and go to places where a designer has been at work, such as shop windows, restaurants, clubs, and other places which aim to create a particular kind of atmosphere. Look through the lifestyle magazines and see some of the rooms which have been brought to life by a brilliant use of lighting. The lighting department of British Home Stores has some marvellous settings and they really came up trumps in our back living room. Because in reality, it is two rooms, a living room at this end and a dining room at the far end. We've used the Yvette range from BHS and these stylish white frames blend well with the modern furniture. As do these Nanette brass lights. And if we add up lighters beneath the plants, we create a marvellous effect. Now for the dining area, we have a brass picture light complete with a dimmer switch. Two down lighters have been positioned to create arcs on the floor length curtains. And they can be directed onto the table and softened by the dimmer. Operate the motorised curtain track and just see how beautiful the terrace and garden is from here. All the lighting effects you've seen and much more besides are contained in this beautiful book published by British Home Stores that really will help you plan your lighting successfully. Nostalgic, yes, but completely out of keeping with a modern kitchen. It wouldn't look very good in a bedroom either, let alone sitting on a barbecue at the end of the garden. Yet these are all places where you might want to make or receive a phone call. What you want is a telephone that enhances the surroundings. Like this genie in the bedroom. And perhaps this slim tail in the living room. A cordless like this freeway which can be used in the garden. And for here in the kitchen, there's no doubt that the Viscount Super 4 is just the answer, since all you have to do is press this on-hook dialing button, dial the number, and carry on stirring the pot until your call connects. Hi, Tessa. Oh, thank goodness you're in. I'm trying to make a Mornay sauce. Do I add the milk and the flour to the melted butter? No, you wait for the flour to cook in the butter and then add the milk. OK, thanks. See you later. Bye. A success. This picture phone is also great for the kitchen. All these telephones are part of the in-phone range, sold by British Telecom. So now, for the price of a couple of years' rental, you can own your own phone and take it with you when you move. All the in-phone equipment runs conveniently off the new plug and socket system. If it gets a bit noisy when taking an incoming call, you can always move to another room by simply unplugging the phone and plugging it into another socket. Ah, where it's a bit more peaceful. Ah, oh, hello, there you are. And with an extension cord, you've even greater freedom of movement around the house. You can have up to four in phones in your home, so before installing them, plan where you need them most and place the sockets to best suit your way of life. One in the kitchen, perhaps a socket in the bedroom, as well as one in the living room. In phones aren't just beautiful, they've got brains too. Take this scepter, an advanced electronic press button in phone in which you can store up to 10 of the numbers you dial most. Just press, say, MR1, and your number is dialed for you. Another sophisticated, highly featured phone you can get is the Venue 24. This model has a 24-number memory store. Last number redial facility, 
as well as a digital display to prevent dialing mistakes. And a clock and call timer, which lets you know just how long you've been talking for, so you can keep control of your phone bill. Installing a money box payphone is also useful for encouraging economy amongst talkative teenagers. Oh, can't speak long. I've got to pay for my own calls now. <laughs> the machine can be switched by the owner for use as an ordinary phone. Perfect for flat shares, or if you have a lodger. If you want real flexibility with a phone, you want the cordless freeway. Marvellous if you're down the garden. No mad dash when the phone goes. Just say, hello? Ah, oh, Bill, it's Tessa again. Oh, hang on a second, Tessa. I just want to put the fork down. Oh, are you dishing up lunch already? No, no, I'm down the garden digging. Oh, well, you've got one of those thingamy phones. Do tell me how it works. Yes, let me try and explain. It can operate 100 metres from the house with its aerial extended. The base unit in the house transmits and receives by radio the conversations from the cordless phone and sends it down the lines like an ordinary phone call. I really must speak to Mary Venton. Sounds as if she's one up on me and has the Robin answer machine, which I can leave a message on. When you're out and want to check if there are any calls waiting to be dealt with, you can phone your Robin and with a voice-activated signal, play back all your messages over the phone. What a useful machine. This way, if you work from home, or if you're tied up in a meeting, you'll never have to lose any business. Now, all the telephones used in the UK must be approved by the British Approvals Board of Telecommunications, indicated by a green dot. And if it's a British telecom in phone, you know it'll have been researched and tested to the highest standard. There are a mass of different in phones to choose from, to suit any room or mood. If you're still feeling nostalgic for a traditional type of phone, try this modern version of an even older style. The Rondo. Hello? Ah, oh, Tessa, it's Bill. Oh, hello. I've just seen this video you've made and I must say you've given me some super ideas. In fact, I'm going to have a complete breathing. It's not all that long ago when our cities were full of smog in winter caused by the coal fires trying vainly to keep the population warm. But things are much cleaner and easier nowadays as most houses are centrally heated. However, if your house isn't, you need to make three main decisions, whether you are starting from scratch or bringing your system up to date. Which fuel to use? What kind of boiler and radiators most suit your property? What controls and other means can be used to minimize your heating bill? First of all, the fuel. It's lovely having a roaring log fire for toasting by, but it's not very practical for many modern homes. Solid fuel is the cheapest to buy, but it's hard work, bulky and messy. Electric fires are expensive, and while night storage heaters are less so, once you've paid for all the heat generated, you've got to use it, whether you want to or not. Oil, with its recent price rises, is no longer very popular. And there's gas. Some isolated homes are not connected to mains gas supply, and one alternative is to install a bulk LP gas storage system, like this one here. The fact remains, however, that three quarters of all installed central heating systems in this country are run on natural gas. It's clean, efficient, has no storage problems, and is popular for cooking. This is the fuel we've chosen for this house. Now let's look at the equipment. The system is made up of three main components, the boiler, the radiators, and the controls. Now the boiler is the heart of the system. 
Its size and capacity depends on how large your home is, and your heating engineer will calculate your requirements. The average house with, say, five to seven radiators needs 40 to 60,000 BTU output. But basically, there are four different types. A freestanding unit, which can have the greatest output, if necessary, up to 150,000 BTUs, and probably best situated in the kitchen. Or a wall-mounted unit, output up to 80,000 BTUs, which can become part of the furniture, like this Apollo. But if sited in a cupboard, it must conform to the minimum ventilation standard. The third option is a back boiler, such as this house warmer, with a 45,000 BTU output, which fits behind this spectacular file, also made by Thorn EMI. Fourthly, there is this combination unit. An ingenious idea because it can be installed almost anywhere, needs no tanks in the roof or a cylinder in an airing cupboard. A sensor in the unit turns on a tap, so you get a constant flow of hot water, and when you turn off the tap, it returns to the business of central heating. Now we come to the radiators. There are two basic choices. Straightforward panel radiators, such as these, or super convectors, which give a greater output of heat from its two panels without taking up extra space. The boiler and radiators are regulated through a central control box at the boiler, like this one, and allows you to control the hot water and the central heating separately. The standard version gives you two setting options a day, while the more advanced model increases this to four. By careful planning, you can ensure that the boiler is only working when you're in and need it. What I like is that if you have a power failure, the clock goes on working with a standby battery. And when power is restored, it will recharge the battery. The main thermostat governs the overall temperature for the house. It's best to keep it in a cooler place like the hall, rather than, say, the kitchen where a hot oven would give a false impression of the temperature of the rest of the house. Try keeping it just one degree less than you'd like and see how much money you save. But one really sensible thing to do is to fit thermostatic controls to each radiator and that way you can really control the heat in each room. If the children are off to school early, the thermostat can keep the room cooler. Back home doing the homework and it can bring the room up to a comfortable warmth. Simple to install and well worth it. The one thing that a radiator cannot do, which a fire can, is give you a focal point for a sitting room. Once again, there are two choices. An imitation coal fire that is designed to heat a room, like this one. Very useful if the central heating is off and you're experiencing a British summer. Or perhaps you might prefer this design. But this model, called a through flue, can even be installed without a chimney. On the other hand, you can have a purely decorative fire, which, while it provides some warmth, is there just for its effect. A super idea to go with central heating and most realistic. Thorn provide these leaflets, and I'm sure you'll find a style to suit your room. With all that it costs to keep a house warm, it's essential that you insulate as much as possible, with loft insulation, wall insulation, double glazing. That's the best way to keep your fuel bills down. Do you ever get that sort of feeling that there's something not quite right with your house? The walls are good and sturdy, the lofts lag, the central heating's pumping away, yet your sitting room feels as if it's on the wrong side of the front door. A lot of people choose to put in double glazing for that very reason. The least expensive form of double glazing is what's called secondary double glazing, one you can do for yourself. At its most basic, it's this glorified cling film stretched taut over the window frame. This sealed box is the same in principle, but with one very dangerous difference. In a fire, you wouldn't get out in a hurry. To be able to live with your double glazing and make it a worthwhile investment, your window should be like this, 
so that you can open it easily to let fresh air into your room regularly. This is very important because of the need to eliminate the threat of condensation in the room. Just through living and breathing, we humans expel several litres of water a day into the atmosphere. Add to that boiling kettles, steamy bathrooms, and the whole house soon becomes filled with moisture-laden air. So remember, when you insulate, ventilate. Fitting good secondary glazing yourself is not easy because to work efficiently, the unit has to be made to fit the window frame perfectly. So we invited Thermostor to show us how it should be done. Having taken careful measurements, a new inner frame is prepared and screwed into the existing frame. The glass panels are slotted into the felt seal ridges and the windows slide open and close easily. They also provide one of the best means of sound insulation. Secondary double glazing is also a perfect solution if you want to preserve the original facade of your house, providing your existing windows are in good condition. But if your windows do need replacing because they're old and drafty, it's only common sense to make the replacement windows double glazed. And in fact, the vast majority of professionally installed replacement windows are just that. The whole window is taken out and a new sealed unit replacement window is put in. And if you prefer Georgian or leaded lights, you can have them too. They make it look easy, don't they? Now, the large bay window like this one, it needs very precise measuring and a considerable degree of competence for the new unit to fit snugly into the opening. Having taken out the old frame, they slot in a new hardwood outer frame, pre-built to your exact specifications in the factory. Fine, the sides of the frame are sealed with mastic to prevent water seeping through. The durable aluminium inner frames are then fixed into position, ready to take the double glazed windows. Thermostore are one of the very few double glazing companies to hold four British standard kite marks licenses for quality assurance, and can confidently offer you a 10-year guarantee. Doesn't that look nice? This cutaway section of one of their windows shows how the company has solved two major problems. Firstly, they found a way of stopping the cold from coming through the frame itself by introducing what they call a thermal break. This gap is filled with expanded polyurethane to complete the insulation. This dry ice experiment, when two different frames are placed side by side, shows just how effective this thermal break is. Secondly, they found a means of preventing heat loss through the glass by filling the gap between the panes with special gases, so you have, in effect, a transparent blanket. When's a window not a window? When it's a double glazed patio door. It gives a lovely light and airy feel to the room while it's perfectly snug and warm on the inside when the door is closed. You can, if you wish, make up a whole structure with double glazed units like this porch, which has added a whole new dimension to this house. Now your house will be free of cold and drafts as well as being a far quieter place to live in. What's more, your sitting room will be back where it belongs, on the warm side of the front door.
Every home has to have a few basic tools, if only a hammer, a pair of pliers, and a screwdriver. And most people have a toolbox with perhaps some chisels, a hacksaw, other bits and pieces. And half the homes in this country now have a par tool of some sort. Because there's always some little job that has to be done, even in our luxury kitchen. Now, what could possibly be missing? A cyclotherm oven? A food processor? No, just a wall-mounted can opener. So how do I go about putting it up? Well, we need a small metal detector to prevent drilling into electric wiring or through metal pipes, and a power drill with a variable speed control. Oh, and this. Stick the masking tape where you're going to put your opener. Mark on the screw holes and load in a masonry drill bit for the size of plug that you're going to use. Set the variable speed to the slowest setting to get more control as you start. Then speed it up once you get going. The tape on the tiles helps the drill to grip and combined with the variable speed stops the tip carving all over your new tiling. Simple but effective. In goes the plug so the screw can grip And your can opener is up. This paintwork needs stripping and repainting. A hot air stripper will sort it out quickly enough. No messy chemicals or naked flames. The hot air stripper does the job cleanly without scorching the wood or wallpaper. The barrel can be adapted with special nozzles like this one to protect glass when scraping window frames. And this one, on the new high-performance hot air gun, spreads the heat over large areas like this door. A jigsaw and a workmate, please. No, a Black and Decker jigsaw and workmate. They can sort out a lot of household jobs for you, like putting up shells. Just get some face chipboard and shelf bracket system from a local DIY shop, you'll soon be able to afford a powered jigsaw from the money you've saved by doing the job yourself. Once again, the metal detector steers you clear of trouble. Put out one frame and mark the hole. Then use a spirit level to mark the holes for the opposite frame. Then drill the holes. And if it's concrete or really hard brickwork that you're drilling into, switch to the hammer action and adjust the variable speed and you'll really get through. Then plug the holes. You can even take the strain out of putting in the screws by using the drill. Measure and cut the chipboard to length, straight and quick. But look at this. You have complete control to saw in any direction. See, you really could make a jigsaw puzzle. In go the brackets and on go the shells. Nice and level at whatever height you need. Now where are we going to put the new video? How about building a shelf for it under the television? I think we should have a chunky looking shelf to fit in with the reconstituted stone fireplace. So buy a length of thick hardwood and you can easily justify the cost of a par saw and an electric sander when you look at the value of the whole project. Easy and safe to use, and I can't think how I could have done it without a circular saw. Most people would abandon the job now if they had to sand all this by hand, but an electric sander makes it all so effortless. I'd like to finish off the edges, but I wish I had an electric plane. Ah, you remembered my birthday.
Now I can plane down the wood to ensure a perfect fit. Put on a couple of coats of varnish, sanding down in between. And there you are, a job you can be proud of. To do most jobs safely and comfortably, you'll need an extension lead. So this new idea from Black & Decker is a super answer to the problem. But some jobs may be beyond that. On such occasions, you will need this, the cordless rechargeable drill, complete with handy carrying case to carry all the screws and bits and pieces. In fact, there is no doubt that many jobs around the house would simply never get done without having power tools. And of course, they're very inexpensive when you think of the high cost of bringing in a professional. If on every job you do, you charge yourself what you'd pay someone else, you'll soon build up a workshop full of tools, which will go on saving you money in the future. When you see a professional decorator painting, it all looks so easy, yet somehow, when you have a go yourself, it's never quite the same. Painting, you know, isn't so difficult, but to do it properly, it does take time. Time which is expensive in the hands of a decorator. Or misspent if you'd rather spend the time taking the dog for a walk. ICI, through 10 years of research, have developed a paint system which adds at least two more years protection to your house than ordinary paint so that you don't have to do the job nearly so often. I'm all for that. Now, you sit there and watch while I get on with it. To start with, you need the right tools. Some of these are essential, others will depend on the job you intend to do. I like to work off a workmate, which you can also use as a hopper. And, of course, an old overall. Thanks. These windows have got into a bad state because they're constantly exposed to wood's worst enemies, moisture, the ultraviolet rays of sunlight, and fungal attack. Thorough preparation is the most important part of painting. Once you've sanded, sealed, and undercoated the surface, the finish will always look good and last longer. So first take off any old flaky paintwork. A hot airstrip is best because a blowtorch could crack the glass and scorch the wood. All loose and cracked putty must be raked out, but any putty and paint which is still sound need only be rubbed down and dusted off. Any wood knots or resinous streaks should be sealed with a thin coat of knotting or they'll discolour the paint. Now we come to the weather shield exterior gloss system and remember all three parts complement each other. Each one contains a fungicide which is effective against rot, mould and blue stains so there's a thorough barrier between the wood and the elements. So let's tackle the first stage. We apply an exterior preservative primer to all the bare areas, not the good paintwork. The most vulnerable parts are the end grains, and this piece demonstrates just how absorbent they are and why they need extra protection. Then you have to make good all cracks, open joints, nail holes and other floors with a flexible stopper. Finally, rub down and smooth off. Now we can start painting, and with a large can like this, it's best to decant some into a paint kettle so that you don't spill the whole can. So here's a trade tip from my professional friend. If you're using a new brush, put tape around the bristles to reduce their length for greater accuracy on small areas. And always work in a new brush like this in undercoat. Now apply a coat of undercoat to all the primed areas and allow it to dry. Always try and keep one side of the paint kettle clean to avoid getting the paint on the brush when you leave it to rest on the side. Now you have to reglaze with linseed oil putty and let this harden. 
Then apply undercoat overall, which gives an even greater protection against bacteria. Finally, we come to the Weather Shield exterior high gloss, the third part of the system. This gloss paint, which comes in a wide range of colors, is highly flexible so it can cope with the natural movement of wood. As you can see, it has a high gloss finish, which leaves a long lasting, brilliant result. Here's another tip. If you're going to use the brush the next day, leave it standing in a jar of water. And when you finish completely, clean the brushes in Dulux Brush Cleaner and Renovator, or White Spirit, and wrap the bristles in paper or tape to keep them straight. Now to sort out the masonry, which is discoloured with age and could do with a new coat of protective paint. First of all, we have to scrape off the algae and mould to get a good base to paint on. The moles may seem to have all gone, but you should brush on a fungicide solution in order to kill off all the tiny spores that remain. After you've left the fungicide for 48 hours to do its job, wash it off with clean water and allow it to dry. Any cracks or holes can now be filled with sand and cement or an exterior filler. If you find any powdery or friable surfaces, you should give them a coat of stabilizing primer. Now you're ready to roll on or brush on the weather shield masonry paint. It's much smoother and easier to apply than gritty masonry paints you can buy because it gets its durability from an all acrylic resin base. Because it's smooth, not rough and textured, it stays cleaner, longer. Naturally, you can choose from a wide range of town and country colours to suit any house or setting. The main benefit, once the job is done, is that the finish of your walls and woodwork will last a lot longer than ordinary paint, which leaves you a lot more time to play with your family and dog. It's not long ago that bath night was a tub in front of the fire in the parlour. Even now, there are still many bathrooms which are cold or steer places with pretty basic amenities. Few people have large bathrooms and most of us only have a fairly small area to play with. But take a good long look at this bathroom and I'll show you how it was planned and what you could do in the same space. In the beginning, it was like this, two perky rooms, a bathroom and the other a lavatory. We removed the wall here and recited the airing cupboard off the landing to create far more room. Plumbing is fairly simple to move and you can recite your lavatory, but it makes sense to try and keep it near the existing soil pipe for easy reconnection. We decided to block this window and put in a larger one here to create more light, where I'd like the base and the mirror to go. Now we've got our new layout, which uses space much more efficiently, we have to decide what goes where. An excellent idea is to sit down with some graph paper and cut out some scale drawings of the units you'd like to buy. you'll find that many leading manufacturers have cutouts in their brochures. Then shuffle them around until you get the ideal layout. Apart from brochures and magazines, you can get a lot of inspiration from seeing complete bathroom sets laid out in larger builders merchants and specialist bathroom centers. 
Here, you can get a good feel for the kind of units you'd like. Twyfords have an excellent selection of units to fit most people's tastes. This Olympian steel bath has been set in an enclosure of tiling to create an affordable feeling of luxury, with plenty of room to fling rubber ducks. Mirrors, either set into tiles when tiling or mounted onto walls, make a smaller bathroom seem larger. Always try to use mirrors that are copper-backed, as the silver ones tend to go. It's worth keeping one of these demist cloths you can buy in motor accessory shops to keep them free from steam. OK, hop in, you two. Built-in spaces at each end are ideal places to keep your bubble baths, soap dishes and plants. These ferns are made of silk because many plants find it very difficult to live in a bathroom. It's important that the fitting should coordinate with the suite, which is one very good reason why Twyford has designed their own. This new fashion colour, sorbet, has all its own accessories, so you should get tiles to match. A heated tile rail is important in a bathroom. Apart from drying the tiles, it acts as a radiator to keep the room warm. Furthermore, it should be plumbed into the primary hot water supply to the storage tank, so that it works in summer when the central heating is off. While this lavatory has good clean lines with its low flush system against the wall, you might consider this more chic. It also provides a useful shelf. The basin too is a matter of preference. Some people like a mixer tap with a pop-up waste, while others prefer separate taps with a plug-in chain. Incidentally, while you've got a plumber, it might be useful putting a wash basin into an adjoining bedroom. You'd never know. It might just stop the morning rush hour to the bathroom. Tum -tum. Right, all changed for the new bath. This is another fashion colour called Platinum, in the Twyford Jupiter range. This time we've put the bath against a different wall and put a hinge screen for the shower at the end. For a touch of luxury, we brought the carpet right up the sides of the bath. We could have tiled this round, or even put on matching panels. Good lighting is essential, but for safety, you must have pull cords or else have switches outside the room. If you want net curtains at your windows, here's a novel idea to save you drilling your tiles. A spring-loaded telescopic pole wedged between the walls like this. So there we are, a fully tiled and coordinated bathroom. Doesn't that look super? While many people like to have a bath with a shower unit, some prefer to have a built-in shower on its own. Twyford's make a selection of trays and surrounds, but when it comes to the shower itself, well, you'll have to wait for the next chapter. The good thing about a shower is it's quick and easy, and it uses only about 20% of the water a bath does. But what sort of showers are there, and which is the right one for you? Just let me slip into some clothes, and I'll tell you. There are two basic sorts of shower. A mixer shower, which as the name suggests, mixes hot and cold water drawn from the storage tanks. And an instantaneous electric shower, which heats up the coal mains water to deliver you a shower wherever you want it. Each one has its advantages, and you should consider both options. So I invited Walker Crossweller, the market leaders, and the only British manufacturer to make both types, to explain to me the pros and cons of each. The main advantage of a mixer type is its controllability. The best models have separate controls for the spray force and temperature. Some models have a built-in thermostat, so you won't suddenly get a hotter shower when someone else turns on a tap or flushes the loo. This shower, the Mara 915, controls the water temperature thermoscopically to ensure complete safety. 
A sensor detects any sudden change in the mixed water temperature caused by pressure fluctuations and immediately adjusts to maintain the chosen temperature. On the other hand, instantaneous electric showers have become very popular because you don't need a hot water supply, only cold mains water. So they are easy to install almost anywhere in any kind of house or flat. The water is heated in this box of tricks, mounted within the shower, which works rather like an electric kettle, only almost instantaneously, to get the water to showering temperature. Here we find another difference between the mixer and instantaneous electric system. The force of the spray coming from an electric shower will fluctuate according to the temperature of the incoming mains cold water. In winter, when the water is icy cold, the spray force will be marginally reduced because it takes a bit longer for the system to heat up the water. Though this is partially remedied by the Marilex Supreme 8.3 kilowatt shower, which is equipped with a more powerful heater. In a mixer system, on the other hand, the spray force remains constant because the system works purely by gravity. The cold water storage tank in your loft, which has to be at least three feet higher than your shower head, provides sufficient fall to maintain a good, constant force of spray in your shower below. However, if you've not sufficient fall, you can always fit a pump. So a mixer system with a good fall, or boosted by a pump, will always be wetter to shower under than an electric system. However, an electric system will always be more flexible because you can install it in places a mixer system could never operate, say in a loft conversion above your water tanks. And another thing you can be sure of with an electric system is that it will never run out of hot water when it comes to your turn to have a shower in the morning. Now, where do you put a shower? The most convenient place is in the bathroom, over the bath. The services and waste disposal are all ready to hand and all you need is a screen. Well, you could install a two-sided shower cubicle like this one in the corner to make an extra facility. And I like the seat that can be incorporated, which is particularly good for the elderly or infirm. A four-sided shower cubicle can go almost anywhere. In a bedroom, on a landing, in fact, just where you fancy one. If you want a bit more elbow room and a more solid construction than a standard shower enclosure normally offers, it is easy enough to build a timber stud and plasterboard enclosure. Tile the inside and across to the shower tray. Inside, you've got a spray head which can be angled in any direction you want. Always remember to install any shower head on a side wall and not opposite the doors. This way you won't inadvertently spray the water out into the room if the doors are opened. You really should read the Mara Shower Book. It tells the whole story of mixer and electric showering and is well worth getting before you commit yourself. Let's see what towers and tiling are all about. When it comes to tiling, there are really only two things you need to do. Choose the tiles and stick them on the wall. The second part's a very easy DIY job, but when it comes to choosing the tiles you want, well, that's not so easy. Just look at this landscape flying past as the biggest choice of ceramic wall tiles in Britain. It's called the Crystal Range. The tiles were designed to coordinate with every possible color scheme and decorative style. Now, we thought about that for the bathroom suite, and that was certainly a candidate. But this was the final choice, called Country Garden. What do you think? Then for the platinum suite, this Cleopatra in Wild Sage, a larger than normal tile, gives a marvelous effect. For the tile shower room in Camellia, 
we used Country Garden again in a different colour and layout. It worked rather well, really. And for the surround for the gas fire in the living room, we chose this. Now let's see what tiles would be suitable for the kitchen. I must say, some of these tiles are so gorgeous, you could just frame them as a picture. Thank you, I'll hang that up. What about this for the kitchen? It's called Impressions. If you follow the very simple rules set out in this free booklet, you'll find that tiling is a piece of cake. First of all, these are the tools you'll need. A trowel and a tile cutter, pliers, coarse sandpaper, ruler, plumb line, spirit level, laths of wood, hammer and nails, and a sponge. And of course, you'll need a bucket of adhesive, grout, and the right number of tiles. And the booklet gives you a simple guide on how to calculate the right amount. The first thing to do is to take all the plain tiles out of the packs and separate those which are glazed on one end or two adjacent ends. Keep those for corners and edges. Mix up the rest of the plain tiles, all tiles, even crystal, very slightly in colour. So never use them pack by pack. Now one tile high off the lowest point of the bottom edge, mark where you're going to tack the wood lath to the wall. Mark up the lath a tile width along as a measuring star. And tack it centered on the wall. and check it's horizontal with the spirit level. Then you're ready to spread the adhesive with the trowel. No more than about a square metre at a time. Comb it out with the spreader, and away you go, applying the tiles to the wall. The important feature with crystal tiles is the angled edge, which gives you the exact spacing for grouting. No need for matchsticks. Now you've finished with the whole tiles, you'll need to cut the tiles for the edges. Mark the tile, never use a marker pen on the back as the ink may seep through the tile and stain the glaze. Then score the glaze side and place the tile on a matchstick. Push down and hey presto. You'll probably also need to cut tiles in around the par points. Score around the parts that need to be removed. Then diagonally score this area to be nibbled away. And smooth down with the carborundum. Finally, take the battening down when they've all set. You can then fill in the bottom row and start grouting, but not for at least 12 hours. For a truly professional finish, draw the round end of the tile cutter, or a lollipop stick, along the joints. Wait for it to dry and polish off with a clean, dry cloth.
The kitchen used to be the hot, steamy engine room of the house, where everything was toil and bubble. But nowadays, with the emphasis on cool, practical elegance, the kitchen has been elevated to the position of a push-button bridge of a sleek modern liner. Kitchens are viewed by house buyers as key rooms in a house, so any money you spend on a lovely kitchen could well make a profit for you when you come to sell your house one day. How then should you set about redesigning your kitchen? This, this basically is, is our, our cameo range, which mm. is... Well, probably most of the leading fitted kitchen manufacturers offer a free design and planning service. So I sat down with a consultant from Schreiber. This would be the great one, yes? Yes. And together, we planned out my ideal kitchen. Looks quite good now, though. What I'm going to do now yeah. is I'm going to... And using all four walls to optimum effect, we came up with this design. This was then turned into a reality by their skilled team. Installing a kitchen might sound like a complex job, but in the hands of experienced professionals, it is a comparatively fast and fuss-free operation. The units themselves have all been through a vigorous quality control procedure before leaving the factory. The installers have to ensure that the units are level, the work surfaces are perfectly aligned and button scribed. So that the overall finish is just as you expected. With most houses, all the work is done in a couple of days. Now let's have a look at how this kitchen was thought out in terms of storage, preparation, cooking and washing up. You always need as much storage as you can get for food, utensils and crockery. So we put the bulk food on this side and here's a marvellous storage unit, four drawers deep and notice this panel on the outside which in fact conceals the usually unsightly exterior of the fridge. While over here we've put the sink with a good work surface for preparation on either side. These excellent strip lights underneath the wall units allow you to see exactly what you're doing. Absolutely essential. It is equally important that you have sufficient power points for all the labour-saving devices. And for safety's sake, make sure that none are within the reach of the sink. It is always best to have too many power points than too few, so you're not tempted to overload any. And here we have a waste bin which opens with the door under the sink. A set of drawers for cutlery, cooking utensils and other things. Now by the window, what most people would have done is to have the sink and preparation area. But how much nicer to have this retractable table to have your lunch on. With the dishwasher close by the sink on one side, again hidden by the panel, and a further storage on the other side. Now we come to an unusual feature. The cooker in the corner, with an extraction fan above it. A really novel way of using a corner to the full, with plenty of work surface on either side, and a good place for storing seasonings behind, just where you need them. Again, more storage for cooking equipment and for crockery, and a dishing up area for service through to the dining room. These end units are really useful for decorations and recipe books. And this small filler area can house a tea cloth. Most kitchens are covered with floor tiles or other hard flooring, but there's every reason to use a carpet, especially if it's treated to resist dirt and stains, as it's so much warmer and quieter. There's no doubt that Schreiber have come up with a very practical kitchen and it's quite clear that the units, drawers and work surfaces are very well made and long-lasting. So now, let's consider the colour schemes. This kitchen, with its grey doors and white trim, is called Cameo Pearl Grey. But what adds a certain je ne sais quoi are these little yellow drawers being in an accent colour. But perhaps you might prefer a completely different colour scheme for the whole kitchen. Pink with the Moon Beach worktop creates yet another effect. 
Then again, this Aspen kitchen with its white frame finish and complimentary work surface is both very smart and very popular. There's a huge choice available and you really should go to one of their showrooms dotted around the country and take a look at their mocked up kitchen sets for yourself and get some free technical and design advice. It's the only way to get a feel for what you want. If you can hive off a bit of your kitchen and turn it into a utility room, you'll gain an extremely useful facility. It doesn't have to be a large space, but it can give you extra storage for the ironing board, another sink maybe, the washing machine, some room for your boiler, a side entrance to the house, and a place for hanging coats. Of course, you can go and buy kitchen units off the peg and fix them up on a DIY basis. But to add lasting value to your house, it's well worth getting the advice from a firm like Schreiber to ensure that you end up with exactly the kind of kitchen you really wanted. It's lovely looking through glossy magazines to see how other people live, but unfortunately such personally designed rooms don't usually fall into one's price bracket. But if you want a new bedroom and you're fed up with seeing the same old ones all around town, there is a firm called Room Sets, who make individually designed bedrooms at a price you can afford. This is a beautiful bedroom, designed especially for us from their country scene collection. But, of course, it didn't just appear out of thin air. So how do you start? Room sets have a very personal approach. One of their design consultants produces a scale model of the room you want to fit out, and together you start working out all the different permutations for the units you need in your bedroom. There are so many alternatives that by doing it this way, you usually get a far better idea of how your room will look. After a bit, I found that I really got into the whole thing. Now for a start, what we need is lots of hanging space. All over here, in the corner, I think we want a double unit, yes. Now let's have another single one next to it. Yes, that's looking absolutely great. Now what about a dressing table by the window? No, no. Try where the uh, fireplace is. Now, another wardrobe on the other side. Good. Now, can we squeeze another one in? Hey, careful up there. Good, that's better. Thank you. Oh, that's nice. Now, what about some chest of drawers by the window? Hmm. Uh, why not stick some cushions on as a window seat. I say this is tremendous fun. Now, if we put an all-sweet bathroom through there, whoops, we end up with a dramatically different kind of bedroom altogether. These designer bedrooms by room sets are an impressive collection of modern units, which, as you've seen, can be arranged in practically any way you like. Once you've established your room layout, the model is converted into a detailed plan for the factory. Your personally designed units are then made on a high-technology production line and installed in your home by a highly trained team, usually in a day. Each drawer can be removed easily for cleaning, won't tip up and glide silently in on nylon wheels. The concealed hinges swing inwards so the edges of even the most closely fitted doors cannot scrape your walls. Adjustable feet compensate for uneven floors by levelling your cupboards and drawers. Much thought has gone into providing ample storage space, including features such as this sliding shoe basket and unique cantilevered rail. With the variety of finishes to the doors and the choice of colour and decorative pattern styles, there are in fact over 700 designs from which you can choose. Then add to that a wide selection of handles and you can ensure that you'll have a very individual room.
A lot of rooms have irregular features which have to be dealt with at the design stage. For example, an old chimney breast can either be designed in or designed out. And by coordinating features such as this vanity unit, you can echo the character of adjoining rooms. Here, the same material on the front of the units is being applied to the wall. This unique slubbed fabric, woven in room-high rolls, has a cushion backing which makes the room quieter and warmer. Using a special adhesive applied to the perimeter of your walls, the fabric is stretched over the surface and bonded to it. Sheer extravagance. As you might expect, room sets can create marvels almost anywhere, even in a small space for a child to sleep and play, and grow into a teenager who needs a workstation for studying. And how about this for a room? The modern equivalent of the four poster. And cupboards finish with foils on cream. This unique cupboard is specially designed for the corner of a room where space would otherwise be wasted. And incorporated within this unit is a cleverly designed shoe cupboard. On the other hand, this design allows for twin beds and makes an ideal spare room. So many people work from home these days that it's sometimes necessary to turn a bedroom into a home office. Equipped with attractive storage units from room sets so you can combine elegance with efficiency. And you can always turn the room back into a bedroom later on. This brochure contains lots more ideas for any kind of room you can imagine. Have a look and you'll soon start designing your own bedroom. Let's look more closely at some of the window dressings we've seen in this and other rooms. When the rest of the room is dressed, and rather beautifully so at that, if you leave the windows undressed, they do look very stark. Apart from the privacy curtains afford, they help to keep the warmth in the room, which is particularly important if you only have single glazed windows. In fact, curtains are a central feature and need to be coordinated with your entire decor. There are two basic ingredients for window dressing, the hardware, poles, tracks, fixings and so on, and the style and makeup of the curtains, headings, ties and other features. The rails are available in different adjustable sizes. It's always important for the rail to extend either side of the window. This extra length prevents light from spilling round the sides of the curtain. It also allows for more guiders on the rail so that the curtains hang better. The curtains themselves coordinate with the bedspread, complementing its features, colours and patterns and with the curtains which conceal the shower room opening opposite. In our second room set of the main bedroom, the antique white chateau design blends in beautifully with the furniture. And the tie backs make a most attractive archway with the curtains open. Now in here we're going to use the monorail discrete track which you can fix very easily yourself. This time, we're going to adapt the rail to take a Roman blind. Having bought the right length of track, the stops are put in at intervals to thread the cords through. Windows often have concrete lintels, so that you need a masonry drill bit, and if possible, a hammer action drill. Then off you go, having marked the positions first. Mount the track onto a batten shaped to the window recess and face it with Velcro. Plug the hose and screw the batten firmly into place. Now you're ready to hang your blinds. Once hung into position, it pulls up and down with a neat folded effect and provides an elegant modern alternative to curtains.
This half tester, as it's called, over the bed, creates a marvelous effect by using the consort shear track by Kirsch in conjunction with the soffit board. And it produces a very feminine feel to the room. And for the headboard, we've used a new solid brass heirloom rail to hang cushions on. And with mini down lighters set in the soffit above, you have a very graceful setting with the hint of a four poster. Now, with a large awkward bay window like this one, you might think you've got a problem. But with this simple form, you can measure the points indicated. And your retailer will pre-bend the Kirsch regular rail so that it fits exactly. It can either be face or top fixed. That is, screwed upwards into the soffit, like this, or wall mounted. Then with this custom-made curtain from British Home Stores, you have a really super window dressing that opens and shuts smoothly. If you have a patio door to curtain, you might like to try this for an idea. Make up a permit with a six inch wide plank and face it with two inches of hardboard. Then wrap matching or toning fabric round it. Anchor the material with fine tacks or a staple gun and fit a Kirsch track underneath and fix to the wall with brackets. Then, with the easy pleat heading and four prong hooks, fit the curtains to the track. To leave the first six inches of the curtain without a pleat and pin to the board. So that there's no gap between wall and curtain. For added luxury, why not have a sesame curtain rail motor? And you have a smooth way of drawing your curtains without them ever ballooning out. Now, isn't that an elegant setting for dinner? Here we've used a deco pole, which comes in three different dimensions and a range of finishes to suit any color scheme. Really nice curtains fitted on good quality tracks and poles make all the difference to a room. So when you're out window shopping, look for this sign in shops. It means that staff have attended a special training scheme run by Antiference and are fully qualified to advise you on all aspects of fitting curtain tracks and achieving the best effects with your window dressings. What do these three objects have in common? A chimney, a frozen chicken, and a carriage clock. They can all be insured. If your chimney is damaged in a storm and needs rebuilding, you can make a claim for the repair costs. If your frozen chicken goes foul in your freezer because the motor breaks down, you may be able to make a claim for that too. In fact, some policies automatically provide for freezer cover. If somebody broke into your house and stole your valuable carriage clock, you could receive prompt payment for a replacement. Many people just don't understand insurance. In fact, modern household proposals are usually written very simply. Often it's just a question of ticking boxes marked yes or no according to the cover you need. Each year, a renewal schedule is sent to you to let you know the revised premium and exactly how much you're insured for but no policy can cover you for everything. A firm like Sun Alliance Insurance settles over 400,000 claims each year. And here are five typical examples. This chip pan has caught fire, causing considerable damage to the kitchen and all the surrounding decorations have been ruined by smoke. Claim settled. Every day, a thousand homes in Britain are burgled and up to 90% of all burglaries are by casual thieves or opportunists. Claim settled. Even with toughened glass, accidents can still happen. Claim settled. Boisterous children charging around the house can cause damage. If you have an accidental damage extension to your contents policy, claim settled. Items which require general maintenance are your responsibility and are not covered by insurance. Old guttering which has fallen down, 
Claim rejected. With some policies, you may have to pay the first part of each claim. This is known as an excess. But how do you work out how much you should be insured for in the first place? Let's start with how to insure your house. Every house has two values, the market price and the rebuilding cost. The market value of the property is dependent on its style, size and location. The rebuilding cost, however, is the amount you need to be insured for because ultimately it's the bricks and mortar that you will have to replace, not the land itself. How then do you arrive at the correct figure? First of all, you need to know the square footage of your house, so measure up the external area with a tape measure. Most insurance companies provide a step-by-step -step guide to help you arrive at the right insurance figure. A table like this helps you pinpoint the rebuilding cost per square foot in your area of the country, according to the type of house you have. If you're buying a new house, your building society will do this for you. However, if you've added on an extension, you will need to increase your original insurance and you should take into account such extra items as the cost of putting in a new kitchen, or a new bathroom, or new built-in bedroom furniture. When it comes to the contents of your house, this is an individual matter, and you really should go from room to room, jotting down the replacement value of all the items. What would it cost to replace your furniture, carpets and curtains? your television, video and hi-fi equipment. What about your books, records and cassettes? In your kitchen you will have a lot of valuable items such as your cooker, refrigerator and dishwasher. All your china, glass and cutlery. And don't forget such things as the spirits and drinks. Presents you may have been given or even your clothes. Again, insurance companies like the Sun Alliance produce useful leaflets with tables showing the sort of items that might well be in people's houses with examples of the sort of values involved. You'll be surprised at just how much all the items in your house add up to. And to get full value, should disaster strike, you really must be fully insured. Insurance cannot stop a disaster happening. The feeling of having one's house violated is as shocking to many people as the loss itself. So how can you best help to protect your home and your family? With buildings, it is a question of proper and regular maintenance. In your home, being more safety and security conscious. Fit good quality locks to doors and windows and use them. You should also be aware of dangers such as using blow lamps. Use time switches when you're out to give the impression that someone's in and ask your neighbours to keep an eye on your property when you're away. You should know where the water stopcock is in case of an emergency. And write your name and postcode on your valuables in invisible ink using a special marker pen. The writing only shows up under ultraviolet light. In fact, to help you make a start on making yours a safe and secure home, the Sun Alliance, Britain's largest home insurer, is giving away free one of these special marker pens. All you have to do is click the coupon in the booklet and send it to the company.